Hey, in this in-depth blade guide, you're gonna find everything from the fundamentals up to more advanced concepts, as well as matchup specific tips and tricks to always get out on top, so no matter the skill level, you can learn something new here. Also, feel free to use the timestamps in the description or the video player to skip ahead to the topics that interest you the most. My ultimate is charging. As far as combat goes, every shuriken is worth 1.5% out charge or 3% for headshots, and dash is worth 2.5% for every enemy hit, so dashing an entire team is worth 15%. It would take 2k damage to farm 1 ult if it wasn't for passive generation, which works at a rate of 1% per 4 seconds. If blade takes in general 1 to 2 minutes to farm, you're getting anywhere between 15% to 30% ult charge passively, so the damage requirement lowers from 2k to anywhere between 1.7k to 1.4k. In conclusion, the idea of farming tanks is lazy and inefficient, as they have damage mitigation tools that EPS and supports don't have, as well as larger health bars, making squishes almost always the priority targets, as they still give good old charge and are far easier to kill, therefore granting dash resets more consistently. That's not to say you should never shoot tanks, but that's a topic for a playstyle video. Also, before we move on, if you don't quite have blade ready and Joanna has nano boost, it's very possible to use the extra damage and tankness from that to farm the remaining percentage on the engagement, saving some time and maybe even getting a kill before ulting. Measure twice, cut once. Alright, you got your ult ready. So, what do you do with it? Go for the backline, run over your tanks? What is a good blade and what isn't? Well, that depends. Sometimes, a solo kill is enough to win a fight, and other times, killing 5 isn't enough. Before pulling out Dragon Blade, there are many factors that must be considered. Are you attacking or defending? What is the time bank and objective status? Which players are alive on each team? Where are they? And what resources are available? It's a lot to consider at once, which is why having good game sense goes a long way, as it makes assessing different situations mostly a subconscious process. But how do you get to that level? The answer is simple, but the task isn't. Compound knowledge via experience. For example, learning how map geometry affects different characters and compositions takes time, but it's extremely useful to understand because it helps you take advantageous fights, break into a powerful defense, keep a power position for longer, get more value out of your resources, etc. The amount of information to take in can be very discouraging at first, which is why I will be breaking it down into small pieces across two series coming in the near future, how to play Genji versus every hero, and how to play Genji on every map. So subscribe to the channel and don't miss out! Alright, and what about the conscious part? The trick is to use the downtime between fights to think ahead, asking your team what ultimates the enemy team has, considering your own, and what the win condition for each team is, to make a plan accordingly. It can be something as simple as focusing a high priority target, or playing proactively because the enemy has better ult economy, or a more complex idea like in the following clip. Knowing the enemy team is likely to push with EMP, I ask my Ana to stay farther back with me so we don't get hacked, and the moment Sombra presses Q we counter attack with Nanoblade, catching the enemy team off guard and resulting in a 5k with a bit cancel and wasted EMP. Now let's apply this thought process to the following scenario. We are defending Eichenwald's point B gate after 2 minutes of match. It's a great spot to stop the payload due to the massive high ground advantage, but the enemy has all of their ultimates and their win condition is Nanoblade, so the only way to win this fight is by playing the resource battle perfectly. After seeing Zarya's allied bubble used on Cassidy and his positioning, I dash up close to the giant wall to use it as cover from the Ana, as well as a way to dodge the grab by wall climbing mid fall. Since she misses me, and Lucio beats safely out of combo range, I immediately go after the overextended cowboy, who uses that I late, trying to make use of his temporary health. Having both cooldowns up, I use my deflect to delay the draw, while waiting for the shields to decay. At that point, there are three possible outcomes. First is dashing out when deflect is almost over, trading 5 ults for 2 since the enemy team wasted nano and dragon. Second is dashing behind Mr. 12 o'clock when deflect is almost over, wasting as much of the overhealth as possible before committing to the kill. 
Third is what ends up happening. Hainun deflects confirms the elimination, allowing me to acquire a new target during the last few seconds. Beat has worn out by that point, so Hanzo goes down too, making for a decisive win on a very important moment of the game, swinging the ultimate economy in our favor and gaining a powerful positional advantage for the next fights. One more clip. This time a dry blade since a lot of players rely too much on nano and never learn how to ult without it, creating a false notion that Genji is useless without a nano on the team. After capping Volskaya's point A, I go for the right flank to get access to the bridge to contest any squishies trying to make use of the high ground. My Ryan is pressuring points while we combo window and visor, creating a lot of space and taking the attention from the enemy team, giving me a great opportunity to pounce on the mercy. I dash through her dealing good damage and press Q to bait cooldowns from Anna and Cassidy, using the wall to hide during the animation and then returning to finish off the mercy that is stuck hiding from soldier's line of sight. Deflect helps me walk closer to the other side, while also chipping away at her health, making it so a dash and a swing will confirm an elimination, which makes committing to the play worth the risk, as the dash reset makes a flashbang one-shot combo very unlikely to happen. With the capture percentage going up fast and no one to contest it or make a play, we secure a clean offense and 3 minutes on the time bank going into the second round. I am unstoppable. All characters have a health bar, but the number assigned to it is only half the story. Anna only has 200 HP, but if she has nade available and the Zarya on her team uses allied bubble on her, that's an extra 300 HP added on top of the base 200. This is known as effective HP. Since Genji regains his dash when he participates in an elimination, fully grasping this concept or not often is the difference between making a play or feeding. For example, a Bastion in third form could very easily tank an entire blade due to his 20% damage reduction coupled with self heals and peel from his team. This isn't applied only to enemies though. If you receive a nano boost, you essentially have double health and receive double healing, so a nano blade assisted by a single brick pack gives you 620 effective HP as long as you don't get one shot. Don't get me wrong, that is a lot of durability but that doesn't mean engaging 1v6 becomes a great idea out of a sudden. Think of it this way, if your team spends all their resources on a single player, it's only natural the enemy team will focus all their efforts into shutting them down. For this reason, having your team pushing alongside you is ideal, as it alleviates the pressure the enemies can exert, either at you or your team, drastically increasing the odds of success. Strength flows through me! Time to kill is a major factor when choosing blade targets. Slashing a squishy character is obviously better than swinging at a tank, or at least that's true most of the times. For instance, Tracer dies to a swing and a dash, but because her resources give her so much mobility, she is one of the hardest heroes to go after, making her a low priority target. Forcing cooldowns is a good way to increase your likelihood of success, but the best way is to reach important breakpoints, which can be achieved via damage amplifiers and also by dealing entry damage before blading, although the latter is less reliable and usually incurs more risk, hence why Dragon Blade is usually coupled together with Nano. Being able to confirm an elimination with just a swing and a dash is great for many reasons, but be wary of clutch heals saving your target and screwing your ult, especially when the values are barely good enough like with Discord Orb or Damage Boost, dealing 200 and 208 damage respectively. Check out my Breakpoints video for a deep dive at all the breakpoint values from the August 2021 patch, and use the link in the description to check out or download the infographics I made. Flow like water. Dashing around the battlefield at Mach 10 is extremely fun and looks flashy, but how much merit does mechanical skill actually deserve? I believe skill should be seen like a tool, which is to say that a player can only realize their potential if they know how to use it. With that in mind, which blade mechanics are worth learning? First, animation cancels. 1. Pressing Q overrides ongoing animations like firing shurikens or milling, so it's possible to optimize your engagement by dealing free entry damage, which can help reach important breakpoints, force cooldowns or even one-shot players. This one is as easy as it sounds to learn, and after some time it becomes a habit you don't even need to think about. 2. 
it's possible to wall climb while readying your blade, which can help avoid damage while you're vulnerable due to the animation timer. 3. The classic swing dash. If you were to simply hold primary fire for the entire ult duration, you would get 7 swings, but if you cancel the swing animation right after it deals damage with a dash, the next swing can start sooner, so it's possible to get 8 or even 9 swings with enough optimization. Not only that, this allows Genji to burst targets through transcendence healing, if done perfectly, as long as the swing plus dash breakpoint has been reached, which usually requires some sort of damage amplification. High skill ceiling, high reward, definitely deserves a lot of practice as it significantly increases the possible blade output. Now let's go over a few dash techniques. To start, flick dashing, the most common and useful of the bunch. It takes a lot of experience to become extremely accurate, but it's well worth it due to its flexibility. You can use it to bait your enemies by faking a target choice and then going for someone else really fast, chaining kills gets easier due to speed and unpredictability, or you can abuse how big the hitbox is by getting very close to someone and dashing away instead of through them, increasing your mobility options a lot and even survivability. To step it up a notch, look at ghost dashing, the apex of speed. It requires great amounts of skill to perform correctly and can go wrong very easily, but the results are pretty wicked. Lastly, there is the iconic wall dash, screwing with 90% of your cool clips. Jokes aside, purposefully hitting a surface to shorten the distance traveled often comes in handy, so think about the map geometry and try to always put it to good use. If you want to master Genji's mechanics, check out my drills video for some great workshop codes to hone your skills. An excellent fight! Finishing things off, here are some matchup specific tricks to give you an edge. Swing Deflect Swing can be a noob trap against heroes with powerful weapons or abilities, such as Anna or Hanzu, as it telegraphs when you're going to cancel your deflect to finish off your targets. Use that to your advantage by holding deflect for longer than they expect you to, transforming this pattern into a deadly poison. Against snipers, if you are closing the distance with dash and the 50 damage won't reduce the time to kill, shift your aim to be a little off target not to align yourself with the enemy crosshair to get headshot and shut down during the animation. My favorite general trick, which can be used to bait out and dodge all kinds of dangerous resources, such as leap dart, flashbang or even graviton surge, is what I like to call as the pause jump technique consisting of a simple 1 second wait after blade has been pulled out where you simply stay out of harm's way, patiently waiting for your opponents to panic and waste key counterplay assets, thus making your job way easier. Anna's biotic grenade and slip dart are big threats when blading, but don't forget about the possibility of a defensive nano, as it can prevent you from getting a dash reset. Be wary of Ash close range, she can absolutely shred you with her hipfire spam without much aim being required. Even though a nanoblade swing one shot Baptiste's immortality field, dashing immediately after swinging won't confirm any eliminations, as there is a small grace period after the drone dies where the effect stays active. Bastion gets two words, ironclad passive. When facing the demon herself, Steal yourself because you bought a one-way ticket to hell. Both of Brigitte's cooldowns can shut down your entire ult, so playing above her is the best thing to do as to avoid shield bash range. If you need to close the gap, dash above her head, swing once and double jump or wall climb to squeeze two or three swings before touching the ground. Always remember that whipshot can be deflected to avoid the boop and try to never engage into an early rally or get ready for some mace to the face. Flashbang may be Cassidy's biggest threat, but don't forget about his combat throw as it can easily screw you over. If D.Va throws a defensive bomb, use that opportunity to get a free kill on her pilot form. There isn't much to say about Doomfist other than to stay aware of his positioning to avoid his effective range. For the cost of less meter sustain, Echo gets more maneuverability than Pharaoh with her glide, making her faster than an ulting Genji. Also, always be on the lookout for duplicate and don't be afraid to blade it, as a Genji copy is way deadlier than a real Genji. When your team lacks defensive resources and gets pushed by an enemy blade, 
Counter pushing with your own ultimate and taking a trade fight is oftentimes required to survive out of that tough spot. Hanzu is very simple to deal with, just don't get randomly logged for a head. A defensive Riptar hard counters Genji while he is holding his sword out, so scouting the red out and dealing with him before using blade is usually the best course of action. Dashing up against Lucio and hoping for a late beat to land a one-shot combo is wishful thinking, so hit him with some entry damage and tempo blade to catch him off guard. You can attempt to one-shot him with damage amplifiers, but at that point you can simply focus down one character or wait for most of the overhealth to naturally decay. Also, be extremely careful of Frogman's utility and mobility and always save dash to close the gap after he amps speed or uses boop. Mei could try to block your dash and screw you over with her wall, but that's about it. She can't freeze you fast enough to save a teammate, unless you need more than two swings for the elimination. Guardian Angel grants Mercy great mobility, but there is nowhere she can go that you can't reach as well. When dry blading, use your dash to follow her between swings, or simply stay in the middle of her escape path to an alley so she can't run away. Valkyrie is the only resource that gives her enough survivability to escape you consistently, so focus her team instead of the moth in the sky. During Coalescence, Moria moves faster than an ult in Genji and self heals for 50 HP per second, so a normal swing dash swing deals just enough damage to kill, although that stops being true if she gets healed by any other source. Supercharger is one of the strongest ultimates in the game, so a well-protected bongo should be destroyed with blade, since shields are meaningless and it only takes two swings to tear down. Perfect airtime management and cooldown tracking are a requirement to slice Farah out of the sky. Save double jump to keep yourself close to her between swings, otherwise the play will fail. Death Blossom is a surprisingly powerful defensive resource if you aren't ready for it. When it comes to Dragon Blade, Reinhardt is like a broken record. He will either try to shatter you or charge into his team and hope for a lucky pin. Simply play above his effective range, not much else to say. Roadhog's hook is only truly dangerous while Genji is pulling out blade, and whole hog can be quite troublesome in the right circumstance. If possible, stay out of his line of sight while not using deflect. Gravitic Flux sounds like a great option against Nanoblade, but not only is it slow to trigger and therefore easy to avoid, targeting Sigma is also a good idea, as long as he doesn't get extra health from his team. Tactical Visor beats Blade in raw DPS, so deflecting during the recovery timer between swings is pretty much necessary to win a fair 1v1 exchange. If Sombra is saving EMP for a defensive play, simply don't press Q, she has the better ult, and her passive neutral game is worse than yours, so a stalemate is favorable to you. The only two ways Symmetra can really mess with Genji is by teleporting away from danger and slowing him down with her turrets, which is to say she is an easy target without her deployables. Molten Core is a very powerful zoning tool, but its vertical reach is limited to Sigma's height, which is a little lower than the apex of a double jump. Going for Tracer is never worth the risk unless she's utterly clueless of your intentions. Unlike Hanzo, Widowmaker is pretty much harmless close range as her only real damage source takes time to charge up, giving ample time to activate deflects. Watch your head during the engagements and match grapple with dash, as easy as that. Primal Rage excels at denying access to a single area so try to bait Winston into protecting the wrong person and quickly switch to your actual targets, forcing him to pull off a precise play to save his teammate or fail. Now that minefield doesn't stick to walls anymore, it's safe to abuse your vertical mobility and airtime to slice anyone standing inside the ulted zone as you aren't going to randomly blow up when double jumping. Zarya Bubbles can single-handedly screw over a blade, so make sure to force them out with your team before hard committing. Also, outplaying Grav is not as hard as it sounds, as you can bait it out, dodge it or even deflect it, although the latter is the least reliable method. Remember, Zaryas are very likely to ult close to them, since the further a projectile has to travel, the easier it is to be reacted to. It's great to be capable of bursting people through transcendence healing with damage amplifiers, 
but it's also very valuable to know how to deal with it without any help from your team. An ultimate trade is a fair exchange, granted you can stay alive and disengage and the enemy team can't push aggressively with the extra sustain. Killing Zenyatta or baiting him into pressing Q before ulting are ideal but unlikely scenarios, so what I usually do is look for an opportunity to assassinate someone on the outskirts of a fight faster than Zen can react to the threats and reach his ally with his aura, which involves dealing enough entry damage to make sure a swing and a dash confirm the elimination. Even if the play fails, I should be able to stay alive keeping two heroes busy and away from the action, gifting my team a favorable 5v4. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope you found it useful. It takes an incredible amount of work to make content like this, so if you want to see more in-depth guides, write a comment down below and don't forget to share this video with your friends!